Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world. It is us here in product support once again with another Build Your AutoCAD IQ webinar presented by us here in technical support. Uh, with me today, I've got Alex Pena. Uh, moderating and helping you out in the chat is uh, Naman Meiserwala. So throw in any questions you might have there. Hopefully they're on topic with what we're covering today, which is drafting with precision. We're going to be using AutoCAD LT and AutoCAD 2018. Uh, if there's anything that differs between full AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT, as always, we'll try to note that so that you don't go searching for something in your program that may not be there. Um, it's been a while since I did one of these, so we'll get into it here. Uh, there's a quick listing of who we are and where we are. We really uh, are covering the country. We've got both coasts covered here in this webinar, plus the Midwest as well. And uh, you see there uh, that Naman is noted as an Autodesk Expert Elite. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, in our forums we have super users, effectively, who are super helpful. And we've corralled a bunch of them and asked them if they'll in a some semi-official manner, help us out in the forums. So you'll see them out in the forums uh, answering lots and lots of threads. Uh, product support, of course, is out in the forums as well officially. You'll see our uh, icon next to our names for that. But uh, when you see Expert Elite, uh, you know what that means. So um, just want to make you aware of that. And uh, sometimes when you put in support cases, you may end up speaking to one of those folks as well as they've agreed to take some cases and uh, they're uh, pretty quick on the uptake so they get the cases really quickly and oftentimes most times can get you a response very quickly as well so before we get started as always there's the chat window in there um, we will get uh, if time allows toward the end we'll get uh, a question and answers uh, I mean in the meantime while we're doing the presentation feel free to you know throw things in there questions you might have non um, Alex and myself will be answering those throughout the presentation, so you don't necessarily have to wait till the end. Um, the session is being recorded. We put them all up on YouTube when we're done, and the links are available in your registration reminder. There'll be a webinar survey after the fact, so if you could give us any kind of feedback, we always appreciate it. Anything you have to say, positive, negative, let us have it. We need it. It helps us to, to tailor the content to you, uh, let us know what, where you're at, what you might want, what you might need. So there's that. Let's move on. Uh, the webinar series is, uh, I don't know, it's about three years, three or four years now we're running these. And this year we've, we've scaled them back a little bit, but we're still putting them out there. We're still doing them, and also, in addition, we're putting up a lot more pre-recorded web content to help you out as well. Uh, but as far as the live webinars, we've got a few coming up. We've got layer management we're going to cover in June. Uh, July, we're covering text dimensions and the styles that, that surround those features. Uh, in August, we'll be doing scaling and hatching, popular feature, must, much misunderstood and maligned. And in September, we're going to cover blocks, attributes, and dynamic blocks. So again, uh, all the previous webinars are up on YouTube. There's a link there to get them. The data sets, the scripts, any uh, sample files we might have used in the webinars, they're all there as well. So if you want to retrace our steps, uh, my suggestion is to always put the YouTube video on half speed. Lots of fun that way. Because some of us talk real quickly and, well, some of us don't. So adjust accordingly. Some good resources for you here, a lot of links to information uh, as we move everything toward the cloud, you know, knowing where to get your products, knowing where to get your hot fixes, service packs, where to download everything. It all becomes that much more important. So make sure you've got these links handy. Also, wanted to let everybody know that next week we will be doing another Autodesk Answer Day for AutoCAD. And um, all, the, all the product design tools for that matter, uh, including AutoCAD, uh, but you can see there the uh, various products from the, from the collections that we'll be covering. Uh, AutoCAD being the main one, Fusion 360, Eagle, life, uh, Fusion Lifecycle, Inventor Vault. Um, so 
If you are interested in joining us for that, we ask you to do so. Uh, please join in and answer any day, answer any question, ask any question you like. We'll be happy to tackle them. Our goal is to have every question that gets asked during that day answered by somebody. So uh, put them up there. If there's any long nagging question you've had or wondered about, put it up there. If it's a, a sudden thing that you've run into, uh, put it up there and uh, we'll see if we can tackle it there. Uh, speaking of sudden things that might pop up, I would like to address really briefly here uh, what happened yesterday, the 17th of May, and that was that we had a little uh, issue, some issues with our licensing service and our servers that, that provide them. Uh, in the 2018 products, there has been a bit of code that causes a crash when there are problems connecting and communicating with the licensed servers. So since the 2018 products have come out, we have seen a, a few of these here and there, but they've always been based on the client side where over aggressive or, or overly strict, I don't want to say overly, I mean, each IT department chooses what they want to do, but very strict uh, requirements on firewalls and proxy servers can create troubles communicating with our licensing servers, so it would end up in crashes. So we've got a few of those since the 2018 products came out, but uh, yesterday we had problems on our end, and that's where the communication troubles arose with the licensing servers. So pretty much anybody who was running a 2018 product, if as long as it was subscription licensed, cloud licensed, uh, you probably had problems yesterday. Apologize for that greatly. We are happy to say that that problem has been cleared up, so you shouldn't have those troubles today and going forward. And be on the lookout for an update that the Autodesk desktop app will offer you next week. Uh, that's the scheduled release date sometime next week. I'm not sure the day, but watch out for your Autodesk desktop app to offer an update. And at this point, if you're running AutoCAD LT or Full AutoCAD, any version of Full AutoCAD 2018, and you haven't updated to 2018.0.2, that should also currently be available in your product updates within your Autodesk account online or through the Autodesk desktop app, which should be running down by your clock in the system tray in Windows. If it's not, look for it in your start menu under the program grouping for AutoCAD and you should see the Autodesk desktop app listed there. So let's move on. What are we covering today? Today we are covering drafting with precision. Uh, all the topics you see there are the things that we're going to go through. But before we get into those, uh, as we always do, we're going to do a small handful of polls, as we always do at the beginning, just to get it out of the way. Uh, I know it's not everybody's favorite part of the webinars, but we will get those going. We just want to get a, a quick um, idea of, of who our audience is, who we're speaking to, and make sure that we're tailoring the content for the audience that is attending these. Like I always like to say, uh, these uh, webinars aren't necessarily intended to be training. They're not intended to be replacements for training. So um, hopefully nobody sees them that way. Our goal is to just expose you to some of the features in the program, how they work, things you may not have run into before, things you may not have used, and you might want to work them into your workflows. So let's close that particular poll. Uh, let's throw out, uh, it looks like 84% of that one uh, saying that, uh, no, it's not the first webinar. We've got 16%, so we've got a few newcomers here. So welcome, glad you're here. Hope you like what you see and hope you visit with us again. Uh, let's crank out the next one here. It'll give an idea of how long you've been using the products. Again, just a general demographics poll here. Let that go a little bit more. Most of you have voted by this point, so that's good. Uh, the overwhelming majority, somewhere between five and ten years at this point. Let me close this out. Let's quickly share the results there with you, in case you're interested. Do 
do a couple more and then we will get into the meat of the presentation, I promise. So please bear with us while we gather a little information. Hopefully it's not too painful. Give it just a little bit longer on this one here. Looks like most people have voted at this point, so we'll go ahead and close it out. I'll quickly share the results with you here. It's like a strong representation. They're using 2018 and 2017, the most current versions. All right. Uh, and this one is not just the year release, but this one seeks to figure out and determine uh, who's using specifically which products, whether you're using a AutoCAD vertical or if you're just sticking with plain LT and plain AutoCAD here. Looks like the majority so far running LT and AutoCAD. Got a couple of Mac users in here, so that's excellent. The vast majority of this content today is going to apply to any and all versions of AutoCAD. So that's what we seek for in these back to basics courses. But um, again, the Mac interface always, it looks a little different, it feels a little different, but ultimately you can do the same things with it. So let's close this one out, quickly throw the results up there. Looks like the majority uh, came in with full AutoCAD on this one. And the last one's a little bit of a left field one here. Has to do with today's topic and has to do with polar, or polar tracking. So I'm happy to see that a few numbers are coming in for the last option. What the heck is that? Which is great because that means we'll get to show you something that you hadn't previously been using and maybe you can use it in your workflows to make your work more efficient, and that's the goal, hopefully, for everybody. All right, so let's share this one, and once we finish with this, we'll get into it. All right. So at this point, I will throw it over to my co-presenter today, Alex Pena, and he will show you how things look in AutoCAD. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Zach. I appreciate it. Um, seeing how we love to hear the feedback on these webinars, I do want to let you know this is my first time presenting some content. So if I do a great job, uh, feel free to throw that feedback in. Uh, if I do not so great job for some reason, feel free to disregard that last uh, slide and we'll move on to the next webinar. <laughs> so the first topic that we have here <laughs> is uh, object snaps. and. Um, Object snaps provide a, a great way to specify precise location on objects within drafting. Um, first thing you want to know is where you can locate this uh, object snap. Um, most of the times and all the times you'll have it activated here at the bottom of your status bar. Um, if you're looking around and you happen to hover over these icons and uh, they'll basically mention what each one represents. If you for some reason can't find the object snap, you just want to navigate to the last icon which mentions customization. From here, uh, you'll be able to access which uh, icons are displayed right here at the bottom of your status bar. And the one you want to make sure is checked on is uh, 2D object snap. From here, uh, it'll represent uh, whether it's on and off with a blue or gray icon. When it's activated, it's blue. When it's uh, inactivated, it is gray. Uh, when, once we open this uh, little arrow here that allows us to see all the different object snaps we have available to ourselves, um, this will allow you to toggle them on and off as well. Um, once we open up our object snap settings, it displays the same information, just in a cleaner uh, formation. And um, from here, you're able to see the markers that represent each one of the object snaps. So uh, if you're looking for an endpoint snap, you're looking for a marker with a rectangle or a square. If you're looking for a center, a circle, and um, uh, along the way, you will notice that all of them have a different representation. Um, Muted. Here are set up to help you in a kind of uh, draft in a more efficient manner. So I don't recommend going in and selecting all. 
just because it'll get to a point where you're going to start interfering with one another. You might be doing some close line work where you'd prefer to have a midpoint snap that's, and then an endpoint snap might come into the picture. So um, only choose ones that you feel are, are going to help you in the type of drafting you're currently doing. Um, I personally like to go in and kind of choose endpoint, midpoint, center, and node as my running snaps. The snaps are continuously on. Um, but obviously that's uh, subject to change uh, based off of your preferences. Um, up here you also notice object snap on, which allows you to basically t toggle it on and off with a check, and um, you're also able to do this with the F3 function key. So what we'll try to do is um, recreate the model up here, and uh, I know it seems like uh, the face of, uh, of a Lego figure, <laughs> but uh, this actually holds the key to us uh, being able to use these object snaps in actual drafting and understanding um, uh, different ways that we can use these to our advantage. Um, so what we have here is a couple circles, couple circles uh, above this uh, this base. And what I want to do is, in order to try to recreate this uh, uh, two lines that are appending this circle to the base, I want to try to use object snaps to, to do this. Now, if you remember, the object snaps that I currently have set are uh, endpoint, midpoint, center, and node. That might uh, not allow us to do what we want right from the beginning. What I'll do is activate the line command, and I can do this from a few different ways, using the line command right here at the top of the ribbon, or by typing in L or line on the command line or dynamic input. Once I activate this, I want to try to activate it from this quadrant so I can make an, a, a line perpendicular down. What ends up happening is it's going to default to the center snap. The center snap is just one of the running snaps that I currently have set. Um, in order to override this, what I want to do is uh, hold down the shift button and hit and right click. I, I would like to display as opposed to the ones that I currently have set. The quadrant one it sounds like the right one for this type of uh, line just because it's going to give me points within the circle that are uh, the compass points, north, south, east, and west. This will allow me to choose the quadrant and allow me to go down. Now what you're going to see is in, initially it's going to try to snap to this endpoint, which is what I want. If I were to continue going down the line, there's the midpoints from my running snap and the endpoint from another one. So what we'll do, we'll snap onto here, and as you can tell, exit out of the line command, it makes a clean, precise line. If I were to attempt to do this without that, it'd be a little bit more difficult. So I'll activate the line command again, just to make sure I can uh, try to make this next quadrant down, as shown in the model above, and I run into the same issue where the center snap is overriding. I'll shift, right click again, and this time I'll choose the quadrant again. And when I go down here though, you're going to notice that I can't connect to this line here. There's nothing that I, that I can do. I can try to uh, append from this one, but then again, that'd be too much work. So what I want to do is uh, shift, right click, bring up this uh, O-snap override menu, and from here I'll have a few different options to make this happen. Seeing how the line is going down and intersecting with this baseline, I can use a perpendicular snap. Uh, the marker right here will let me know what to expect when I do click on it. And once I do that, there I have a perfect perpendicular line connected to the base. Exit out of the line command, and we're almost halfway there. <laughs> now to create these uh, center circles. Seeing how I had the center uh, snap set up from the beginning, I want to click on the circle command, and you'll notice that the circle snap is perfect for this type of instance. If you're trying to find the uh, snap itself and can't for some reason locate it, always reach out to the outer boundary of the circle and it will automatically set up the center snap for you. From here, I want to complete the command and do a diameter, so I'll type in a D as prompted here. Um, normally the circle command will defer to the radius. Uh, you can choose diameter by typing in D on the command line or the dynamic input. And I want to make this diameter one unit. I want to then go ahead, hit enter, which will allow me to bring the circle command back up and do the same exact thing here. Reach out to the outer boundary. From here, I'll be able to put in one unit diameter, one unit, enter. Now, in order to get these lines that sort of uh, are in a parallel from each other and 
are very flush with the surfaces of each circle. In order to do this, I'm going to need to use one of my object snaps. And um, we want to just go in here and uh, activate our line command. Now, if I go in here and try to do based off of the running snaps, which I already have set, as I mentioned before, uh, it's going to be kind of tough. I, I won't have too much things to append to. So I want to hit Shift, right click, and from here I'll be able to use an override with the tangent snap. What the tangent snap is going to do is take this point within this circle and append it perfectly. Shift, right click again, tangent to this circle. The connection will be flush as expected above. You can use this, um, the command, the circle command itself has a, an option for a tangent, tangent, radius circle and a tangent, tangent, tangent circle. Um, and these commands are very similar to that object snap um, and something that we could explore later on in a webinar. Now in order to get the same exact line as shown over here, what I want to do is go ahead and, and do the st same steps we've been doing. Activate the line command, right click, Make sure we click the tangent override. From here, we'll be able to go here. Shift right click, hit the tangent. Now this, um, this part of the project has been completed fairly quickly, but it could be quicker if we went through and set that as one of our running snaps, the tangent. And that's one thing as you become more comfortable with the program and um, the different snaps that you can choose, where you'll learn to choose which ones will help you complete your project more precise and more efficiently. Um, I just wanted to display the, the possibilities of the uh, object snap override and how efficient and cool that thing is, just because if you're in the middle of a command and for some reason forgot to set one on, you could always jump right back in and uh, set it. So now to set these, uh, this, these lines that are parallel to these two here. Um, so this is a three unit length line with a three unit gap, a three unit length line again, with uh, what seems like tangent lines to the circle. In order to complete this, I'll be using a few more uh, uh, object snaps that are available to us. The first thing I want to do is activate the line command. From here, I want to go from the center of the circle. And if I were to try to draw this line as accurate as possible, I'd probably have a tough time to get it to be perfectly parallel between the two. So what I can do is if I shift override and use the parallel object snap, it will basically give me this, this trace of a, of a point. From here, once I connect to it, I'll have a perfect tracking line that allows me to create a perfect parallel line between the two. What I want to do then is uh, type in three units to create the first three unit length line. Exit out of the command. And from here, we have the first point of this line. Now to get the gap. In order to get this gap, I, I could draw a line between the two points here and then trim it, but that doesn't seem too efficient. What I want to do is hit line, shift right click again to bring up my override. And I want to make use of the extension snap. What this allows me to do, allows me to go from this end point here and allows me, once I set up my parallel snap, to create a, a unit length of, say, three units. This will basically extend out from this end point and allow me to start my next line, three units, or how many units I'd like after that end point. So if I type in three here, oh, had the first. <laughs> so if I uh, activate the line command, Shift, extension. Yeah, there it is. From there, I'll be able to do three units which will then allow me to do the parallel snap of three units. So now that I have the uh, three unit length line, the three unit gap, and the three unit length line, I can finish off this by uh, doing the tangent lines up 
to the center of the circle. What I want to do then is activate the line command, use the tangent, to this point, hit enter, activate the line command, to this point. And from here you see that we're able to use a variety of different snaps. As I mentioned previously, you could just go in and set most of these snaps as running snaps by clicking them on. Therefore, they'll be on throughout this entire product, the entire model. And then from there, uh, we want to have to use the override as often. Um, but we were able to recreate the model pretty easily. Um, and as you saw, the green line that uh, kind of helped us align uh, with the parallel command was the polar tracking, which kind of leads us into the next step. Uh, well, polar tracking is uh, it's prompted when you're creating or modifying objects. It creates temporary alignment paths. So it basically allows you to create a very precise line um, and uh, can be found also on the bottom of your status bar here. Um, as always, as I mentioned, you can come over here and make sure that polar tracking is uh, checked. And what I'm going to do is, now that it's checked, turn it off. I made a pretty basic isometric cube here. Each one of these lines is about uh, five unit lengths long at a 30 degree angle. If I were to try to recreate this uh, cube just without uh, polar tracking on, what I'd want to do is activate the line command specify a starting point. From here, in order to try to get that 30 degree angle, I'm going to have to try to type in a locking angle. And what that takes into account is a, a, your left side bracket, and then you type in 30 or whatever desired angle you'd prefer. Um, once, I t once I do that, it'll allow me to basically create this line on a 30 degree angle on each, in either direction. I can then go ahead and type it five unit lengths long, and I have my first line. In order to do the next step, I would have to then lock the angle at 90 degree and then type in five units long. Now, and, and so forth and so forth. Um, so you can see how long it would take to try to recreate this thing. So what I want to do now is delete this and go into the options here of the polar tracking. Once we go to the tracking settings, we have a few different things available to us. We can choose the increment angle. Um, these are the ones Auto, Autodesk provides to you um, with the AutoCAD program. These are set to default uh, at 90. Um, you can change these to your desired angle. Um, if for some reason you don't find one you'd like, you can always add additional angles by clicking this on and uh, adding in a value that you'd prefer. Right now at the moment, what we want to make sure we have on is 30 degrees, which is already set and the polar tracking which is on. We can toggle it on and off here. We can toggle it on and off here. And we can also use the F10 function key. So now that it's turned on, I will activate the line command. And you will notice that I have this green line here at every 30 degrees. So if I go up to 60 degrees, it, it locks in at 60. If I go into 90 degrees, it locks in every single time. This is great for when I'm trying to recreate this as I'll need that 30 degree angle pretty pretty often. So I'll go here, type five in. I'll go here, type five in. Five in. And I'm able to do this pretty easily, as you can tell. Uh, each one just going in and uh, recreating the cube in a sense or recreating a draft if you are trying to uh, have a particular angle would be a lot easier once you're using this command. Uh, as fast as that took us, it would probably take less time if we, if we got to the point where we were very comfortable with it and we knew exactly where, what our end goal was. But that's all I have for you folks today. Uh, I'll switch it over to Zach and he'll be able to explain more Unmuted. other topics. Thanks, Alex. All right, so um, there we are. Make sure you all can see my screen. Give it a minute here. All right, I think we're in business. So a couple of topics that Alex covered were polar tracking and object snapping. So the next thing I'd like to bring up is um, uh, something that combines the two of them.
Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to reiterate uh, part of what Alex said, where he was saying that if you just turned on all of your running object snaps, then you wouldn't have to deal with all this override business and shift, right click, and whatnot. But believe me, if you ever tried to draw something where there's a lot of lines, a lot of objects, and a lot of this and that, if you have all of your running O snaps turned on, you will almost assuredly, unless you are painstakingly careful and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, you will almost always end up snapping to a point that you didn't intend to because the object snaps. There's one called nearest. There's a nearest O snap. And if you choose the nearest O snap, it will literally snap to the nearest object that it finds. And that's this guy right here. So anything you get in here <laughs> and happen to click, it's going to be there. So may not be the best option to have all these turned on. I mean, there is a select all button here in case you want to do it, in case your model isn't very populated with a lot of objects that are very close to each other. But um, I think that's pretty few and far between. So a uh, best practice is to definitely come up with a combination of the object snaps that are right for you. So turning back to Polar snapping is uh, the next thing we're going to cover here. Now, um, if we go into the object snap settings, it takes us to our drafting settings. And drafting settings covers a lot of different things. We're not going to cover them all in this particular webinar, but I just wanted to show you that drafting settings has a lot of things to cover here. So I'm going to turn on snapping, and I'm going to set up for polar snap. Now. Polar snap, we'll show you what that is here, and a polar distance. Let's set our polar distance of uh, to continue Alex's theme. Let's go with five. So we'll say OK here. You notice the little blue icon for snap mode just turned on. You can toggle that on and off with the F9 key, as the tooltip there suggests. But for now, we're going to leave it on. And I don't have anything preconceived here, so we're just going to go with the line command. And, and our first point. Let's just go zero, zero. Now in Alex's example, he used polar tracking angles of 30, 60, 90, so we'll go with that too. Now, I specified my polar distance of five. So with polar tracking on, it limits you to the, you know, it locks and snaps to the, gives you the tracking vector for the particular angles. But with polar snap, you have a snap distance. Not only can you go to the specific angle that you want, but you can also draw in the specific length increments that you want. So if I'm on my polar tracking vector for the particular angle, it's only going to let me click at increments that go along with my specified polar snapping distance, which was 5. So any increment of 5 I can do. So if I wanted to go, say, 5 here, and then go 150 degrees that way, and go to a distance of 10, that's fine. I'll go back 30 and go 5. I'll go back 150 and go 10. So you can see there that the precision is, is both in angle and in the length. Now, one thing I do want to point out is coordinate entry. Anytime you're prompted to put in a distance, you don't necessarily have to click. You can always type. Uh, you saw a moment ago when I started the line, I put in 0, 0. I typed that into the dynamic input pointer. If I happen to have my dynamic input pointer turned off, I could type it at the command line. Same result. Uh, same thing when you're, when you're in the middle of a command and you're doing a line and you stay, click here, and you're going to go 30. Let's say I don't want a, a length of 5, though. Let's say I want a length of 7. I can just type in a length of 7, and I'll get a line that has a length of 7, but it's 30 degrees, just like the ones that were multiples of 5 previously. So in instances where you want to override your uh, polar snap, you can certainly do that with direct input. You can also uh, just toggle the snap mode off, but then that also um, limits the other things you can do. So it's handy to keep it turned on for this purpose. Now, now what can you do with this feature? Why would you want to draw a zigzaggedy line like that? I don't know. But what we can do 
is one thing that it can be used for. Let's just give a, a real world example here. Let's say uh, I'm going to go 3.5 as my polar distance and I'm going to limit my angles to only 90 degrees. So let's start a line here. We'll start it at 0, 0. And we'll go up 7. And we'll go over 10 and a half. And we'll go up 7. And we'll go over 10 and a half. We'll go up 7 and over 10 and a half. And up 7 and, and running wide 10 and a half is, gets us close to or within the reasonable allowances for standard uh, step sizes. So that's one particular instance we could do. And, and if you turn, found that you ended, ended up wanting to go, um, you know, 7 up 11 across like it's supposed to be, the, the actual 7-11 uh, standard, we can do that too. We can go up 7. And even though we've got the snapping turned on, we can just point our cursor in this direction along the snapping vector angle of 0 degrees and just type in 11. And then we can go up 7, click, go over, type in 11. And go up 7. And now we don't want to go 14. We want to go 11. So we'll type it in. Although I don't think it... There we are. And we'll just press Enter to get out of it. Now right-clicking uh, will bring up that shortcut menu where you can enter to end the commands. Spacebar does the same thing. Pressing enter on the keyboard does the thing to get you out of your commands. One thing that I see a lot of people do, and I wanted to cover it real quick here, is you can turn your right-click into an enter key. And not just an enter key, but the one that I'm fond of is the time-sensitive right-click. So if it's a very quick click, it will do an enter. And if you hold it longer than what's specified here, 250 milliseconds, you'll get your right-click menu. So it's the best of both worlds. Actually, I don't think I clicked OK there. There we are. So for example, if I did a line, and I went up, and I went over, and I went up, and over, and I right-clicked very quickly, it would just end my line command. Now since Enter, by default, repeats the last command, now my quick right-click starts my line command again because that's the last command I did. Now additionally, in not just object snaps can get you precision, but um, some things we might not think about give us precision. Like I could go back to the previous point where I left off and use my endpoint object snap to snap to the end of this line. But if I know I want to start back over from where I left off, I can just quickly right click the mouse and it will automatically start off where I last left in my last command. So that's one way to get precision without using object snaps. Uh, another way is to use base points for basic commands. And if we wanted to, say, extend our staircase here, we could draw more stairs, but we've already drawn a few of them. Let's say we want to, and then we made to need to make a staircase of 12 stairs instead of just these three. We can control shift copy with base point. So control shift C is what does that. That's the keyboard command. You can find it up on your on your uh, uh, clipboard options here as well, but I just think it's faster for the keyboard entry. Control shift C. Now we're being prompted for specifying our base point. I want my base point to be the bottom of this step here. And then it's copied into your clipboard. So then if we do a paste operation, we can just quickly and using object snaps, paste our stairs to the top of the last one. And there we've all of a sudden got 12 stairs. They're all perfectly spaced. The angles are exact. And it's a very precise piece of work. Now on the subject of coordinate entry, you did see a little bit of here. You saw a little bit of it in Alex's uh, examples where he was typing in numbers. And one thing that isn't often, again, it's one of those things you take for granted if you've done it for a while, but if you don't know it, you wouldn't use it. Uh, it's not exactly intuitive. But if you just click a starting point of, a, say, a line, for example, and you move your mouse in the direction that you want to go, and you just type in 8, it goes 8 units in that direction. Now coordinate entry at the dynamic input pointer 
and varies by default from what happens at the command line, and I'll show you what I mean here. Now, my dynamic input, uh, I can toggle it on and off with the F12 function key. Let's get in here and turn the dynamic input pointer on so I can see it down along my status bar here. And I'm just hitting the F12 key on my keyboard. And you notice that the icon there is going from blue to gray because the F12 key functions to enable or disable it. Same as just clicking on it. But you have to have it turned on on the status bar in order to click on it. But F12, everybody's got an F12 button. So you can toggle that on and off without having it on the status bar here. Now, if you right click on this, we get the option to go into dynamic input settings. And right now, I've got pointer input enabled. So if I go into settings, these are all the default settings here. Now, when you're typing in coordinates, by default, at the dynamic input pointer, you're going to be entering coordinates relative to the point where you are. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So if we draw a line and we start it here, and we go up, and we click the end point here, it's going to prompt us for the next point. Now, I can type in, oh, let's say, four units in the x-axis, comma, five units in the y-axis. And the end point of that next line is four units over from my last line that I ended up with and five up from there. So it's relative to the point where I was at the time. Now, let's contrast that with what happens if we're using absolute input on the dynamic input pointer. So let's go back into dynamic input settings and we'll change it to absolute coordinates. So if I drew the same line, I'm just going to trace over the initial line that I drew here. So I'm going to start here, we're going to end here. It's going to be prompting for the next point. And if I put in 4, 5, like I did before, it's going to actually make the end point 4, 5 in the drawing. So you can see it's very close to the, I'll turn on the coordinates here so you can see what we're looking at. So if you hover over this endpoint and you look down here at the coordinates on the status bar, you'll see that this is 4x, 5y. Whereas the endpoint over here was not. It was just happened to be 4 in the x direction and 5 in the y direction relative to the previous point I left off. Now you can override any of those features if you happen to know what you're currently running. So for example, if you are running with relative coordinates, which is the default, and I start a line, and I decide, oh, you know what, I want the ends of this line, this next line, to not be relative to this point. I want it to be an absolute. You can just type in the pound key and put, then put in your coordinates of, say, 4, 5 again. And it takes it over here, even though my dynamic input pointer is set to relative right now. So if I hadn't put in the pound sign before the 4, 5, it just would have put the end point 4 in the x direction, 5 in the y direction from my last point. Uh, the opposite is true as well. If you are set up for dynamic input pointer input for absolute coordinates, but you decide that you want a relative line or a relative endpoint. So we'll do the same thing here. Now if I put in 4, 5, it's going to go to 4, 5. But I want it relative to where I am right now. So I'm just going to put the at symbol, 4, 5. And it moves it 4 in the x, 5 in the y, relative to my last point. So that's the way to override that. So hopefully you're getting that no matter what you've set, there's an override for it. And remember that scene in Armageddon where they said, what happened to the manual override? And they said, it was overridden. There's an override for everything. So keep that in mind. You're never locked in or limited to doing anything. There's always a way around things. So even if it seems like the settings you've chosen might limit you to what you're doing, it just depends. Depends on the scenario. Depends on what you're drafting at the time. Now, um, one other thing 
that I wanted to cover, and I touched on it briefly, is the concept of your function keys turning the various snap settings on and off for you. So, and that is true. So what you'll see, if you, if you hover over anything that has a function key equivalent, like grid mode is F7, if we had F7, we'll see that the grid toggles on and off. Hopefully with the screen, you can see that there. And you can see that the icon turns on and off. Same thing with the F12 on the dynamic input mode. So I just wanted to take a moment to go through the various function keys and the, just the ones across the top and uh, what some of them do as far as turning on and off your status bar icons because it can be a lot quicker just to reach up and hit that than necessarily interrupt what you're doing with the mouse in the program at the time and, and click one of those I, uh, I buttons. Or you may not even have the button turned on along the status bar, in which case it's a heck of a lot easier to press the function key. So number one, F1 uh, has nothing to do with precision and, auto, uh, and snapping. It, it opens up the help, the online help, uh, or offline help if you've installed that, relative to the command that you have going at that time. So if you're in the middle of a line command and you press F1, it'll bring you to the help topic talking about the line command. Uh, F2 brings up your expanded history, and there's the command line down here. Now some people have the command line floating I like to have it docked. Uh, some people like to only show one line. Some people like to drag the edge up and show more. But no matter whether it's docked or whether it's floating, if you press F2, you will get an extended history of the commands that you've most recently put in. And F2 just toggles it on and off. If it's docked, and you press F2, it ends up looking like that. And if you have a lot of stuff, you can always roll up with your mouse in here. Eventually, it, it will go to the point where you will start aging out old commands. You can't go to the very beginning of the drawing if you've been had the thing open for three days and been running commands on it. It uh, won't take you up quite that far. F3 turns your running object snaps on and off. And if everybody looks down here at the status bar, you'll see the O snap shows F3 next to it. So if I press the F3 key on my keyboard, that indeed enables or disables my running object snaps. F4 is a bit of a different key in that in AutoCAD it does one thing and in AutoCAD LT it does a different thing. So in full AutoCAD, it turns on additional 3D object snaps for snapping to different faces on different planes. Uh, typically, you're not going to run into that sort of thing in LT, AutoCAD LT, so that uh, does something totally different. In AutoCAD LT, the F4 key toggles on and on off your tab mode, which is if you happen to use a digitizer tablet, it will enable that feature or disable that feature. It's disabled by default. Uh, F5 is your ISO plane. And isoplane is a little difficult to describe, but um, it helps you to do what Alex had done earlier in that he drew an isometric cube. Now that cube wasn't indeed a 3D cube, but it looked like it. It's fake 3D effectively. And uh, the isoplane snapping options help you to craft something like that. Uh, it'll make it so the grid, for example, isn't a grid that's straight up and down. It'll be a grid that's at an angle, as if you were looking at a 3D space. So play with that. Um, it's Like I said, it's a little difficult to just to describe. It's more something that you have to get into, and, and we're not covering it that deeply in this webinar. Uh, dynamic input is only for full AutoCAD. Um, turns on and off the UCS detect variable, which doesn't exist in AutoCAD LT, and there was no other feature that they mapped to the F6 key in AutoCAD LT. So AutoCAD LT users, you don't have functionality for F6 key unless you use your customized user interface to remap that button for something else. F7, as we showed earlier, is the grid display. It will toggle that on and off. F8 is your ortho mode, which we didn't cover here, probably cover in a different webinar, but ortho mode restricts the movement of your cursor to only 90 degree angles. And we'll just show that real quick here. So if I'm drawing a line and I start, I can only go at 90 degree angles.
pretty exciting stuff there. All right, moving on, F9, grid snap. Grid snap we didn't really get into much, but you notice with the grid turned on, you could potentially draw and snap your lines to the major and minor intervals of the drawing grid that's behind you in the background there. So you can see where that would be helpful if you were drawing something very precise and needed the grid points. You can also turn the grid display instead of lines. You can just have individual points where the corners of the grid instead of having grid lines everywhere. So just depends on your preference what you want it to look and feel like. Polar tracking, we covered that here. Uh, polar tracking turns on and off with F10. Now you notice what happened there. I had ortho mode turned on and I pressed F10 and it switched to polar tracking on. These two features are mutually exclusive, so having one on will turn off the other one. So if I switch to ortho mode, you notice my polar tracking icon turned off. Moving on to F11 is the object snap tracking. So the object snap tracking is a little uh, something we didn't quite cover too much here, but it's what enables you to pick a point out in space relative to objects. So you're not snapping on a particular object, but you're, you're say, eh, going from here, and I want to go down, and of course I've got my, my uh, polar snapping turned on. It's going to throw a monkey wrench into this whole thing. Let me turn that off real quick here. There we are. So if I wanted to pick a point that was 90 degrees from the top corner there and the left corner there, these tracking vectors that you see, those are what's provided by object snap tracking. And turning that off is F11. And this is this guy down here, this object snap tracking icon right here. And then finally, F12, as we talked about before, is your dynamic input pointer, turning that guy on and off. Some people, uh, when, when, boy, I'll tell you, when the, when the dynamic input pointer came on the scene, it was such a firestorm. People saying, what is this thing floating around? I hate it. I hate it. Turn it off. So, of course, there's a way to turn it off. You can toggle it right off and do all of your coordinate input and command input at the command line. We hear you. Long-time users, thank you. We hear you, and we, we make that possible still. Um, I don't ever see that going away. So, But a lot of people really, really like the dynamic input pointer. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to view the coordinates down here. But you can turn that off, and you can still view the coordinates then as you're drawing in the dynamic input pointer. So the coordinates are only showed, shown while you're drafting, and they aren't just a running thing that's always on down here at the bottom in the status bar. So hopefully uh, that helps. And at this point, we've got a few minutes left, uh, which almost never happens in the webinars I do. So let's, let's get into the uh, chat. Let's uh, open up microphones uh, for our uh, organizers here. And let's take a look and see what we've got for uh, questions. Alex and Zach, thank you so much. Uh, that was very informative. I always pick up something new every time. I uh, help out with these webinars so it's awesome because uh, some of those uh, tips that I used back then are changed and for keep forgetting to use these new technology you know new features and things so even for old schoolers it's awesome to view these webinars and learn something so uh, and uh, we, based on that um, I think uh, that some people really like the uh, feature sets of uh, polar tracking and um, and then they, somebody was asking us about, is there a way to um, prioritize the OSNAP? Hmm. I guess I'm not, hmm. Let me, let me read a little bit here what they've put in here. Uh, I did post a solution on it, but I uh, just wanted to uh, see if you had a better answer on that or just... No, uh, the uh, not really <laughs> is, the, is the short answer. I mean, you're running O snaps, um, rule the roost, and you can toggle those whole things off, and you can just only use overrides, or you can use a combination of both, like Alex showed during this. But um, you know, the bottom line is, when you get close to something, it's going to interpret that with whichever 
running OSNAP you've got turned on, again, we go back to that nearest OSNAP. If that thing's on, it's almost always going to take precedence over everything else because there's no specific point on, you know, with the nearest OSNAP. So that's one that's a little bit, that can get you into trouble if you've got that one turned on. So I would say don't use that one because it will seem like it has a preference over the others, but in reality, they're all about the same weight. Another person was asking, how do you open up drafting settings, how to get there? Oh, yeah. Uh, the OSNAP settings very quickly and um, color tracking. Yeah, that is something that, that I wanted to get into also. There are a couple ways you can do it. Um, you can, on any of these icons in the bottom here, you can right click and, for example, on the grid stuff, you can go to snap settings or um, ortho mode, you right click, uh, let's see, if you're, or your O track, you can go to tracking settings. Any of these right click options, if you choose the settings on the bottom of the menu, it'll take you to drafting settings. Um, as far as I know, and I looked around a little bit because I was hoping to throw it in here, uh, as far as where to launch this drafting settings from somewhere in the ribbon, but uh, if it's there, I didn't find it. It may be up there in the ribbon somewhere, but I didn't find it. You can type in D settings, but for me, the quickest way to get in there is just to right click and choose any of the menu options to get you to the drafting settings dialog. And once you're in there, you can go into any of the tabs. Now, D settings is a command that you can type in, and any command that you can type in, you can make a button for it and put it on a ribbon or put it on a toolbar, so it is something you can click, but, you know, to my mind, it, it's just a right click and you're already there. Let's take a look here. Uh, is there a trick to get the F keys functioning? Um, oh, uh, well... Not that I know of. Uh, you do need to be active on the window, so if you've clicked on a different uh, program and you come back over, your, your, your crosshairs might come back, but the focus isn't really back on your program. I've noticed that is something that can, can throw you. Um, but typically, if you're on the program and you're either, you know, if anywhere you are, you, can, you should be able to hit those function keys and get them to toggle on and off the features that, you're, um, that you want to turn on and off there. Uh, of course, you hey, know. Alex, hey, Zach, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, on the newer laptops, and uh, there is an issue where the manufacturer ships with the function key locked. Oh. So the function keys behave as their, uh, well, the F keys behave like the function key of the laptop itself and not. Uh, so you have to toggle that first before it, uh, you know, gets into the F key mode. That's instead. a good that's a good point, yeah, and that, that's true. And, and especially um, what we're hearing now is that a lot of, well, not a lot of, all of the newer MacBooks are coming out with, um, it's not even physical buttons anymore, it's a touch bar across the top. And the goal is there that you will have function, you know, program specific function keys that pop up depending on which program you have active at the time, which is pretty cool. But uh, from what we're hearing out there in the forums, that uh, for AutoCAD purposes, the the escape key, lack of the escape key in particular, has caused some trouble out there. But um, within Sierra, the new Mac operating system, you can you can map keys to do pretty much anything you want. So if it really comes down to it, you can uh, take the the function mapping for the keys and do something else with them. But yeah, the function key lock is something that yeah. I, I, Forgot all about that. Um, so change that, and uh, you should be in business if there's a setting for that for your particular laptop. With with uh, desktop keyboards, I normally don't see that that happens, but uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility. While we're talking options, can you just show them how to change the right-click context menu options? Sure, absolutely. So they want to use it as an enter key? Sure, absolutely. So let's go to options. We'll go to the user preferences tab, and then we'll go into right-click customization. Now, by default, it looks like this. Uh, if you're, if one or more objects are selected, right-click means shortcut menu. 
Uh, if no objects are selected, right-click means shortcut menu. Some people like to have it set like that. But to my mind, that eliminates your ability to get into the shortcut menus unless you've got a command going. Um, some people like uh, just right-click just to be enter only. So uh, again, my preference, and you know, this is just my preference alone, uh, is the uh, time-sensitive right-click. You don't have to use it that way, but I sure find that it's pretty slick uh, because it makes it so that you your right-click then does dual duty, both as enter and or repeat last command. Um, but it also, if you hold it just a, a split second longer, uh, it brings up that that uh, very important you know, shortcut menus, which offer a lot of things. Uh, that are context specific to whatever you've right clicked on. So I hope that helps. Looks like we are at the top of the hour. I do want to throw out one last poll just because everybody loves them so much, but <laughs> we always like to put this one out here. Um, and this is Did You Learn Something New Today? We hope that you do. That's why we do these things. Uh, like Naman said, uh, even if you're a long-time user, there may be features that you haven't used them in so long you forgot them. Or maybe you just never learned them in the first place. AutoCAD is a deep, deep, deep program, being as old as it is. And there are features that have come and gone throughout the years. Some of them are gone now. Some of them are legacy. Some of them you can still get to only on the command line. Um, but uh, the, a lot of the good stuff is still in there. So hopefully these, these webinars are, are helpful in that respect. So as always, I uh, want to thank you for hanging out with us today. And in the slide deck, there are some additional resources, lots of links. Um, the one that specifically I put in here is for the shortcut key reference. It's got more shortcut keys than the ones I covered today, but it does include the function keys and all the modifiers for shortcut keys, so that helps. Um, any follow-up questions? There are links in the in, in your invites there. Um, so again, all this stuff gets put up on YouTube. So if you want to check it out, check that out there. Set it on times two speed. You'll get through it in half the time. We've got some questions. Thank you very much for those. And thank you as always for joining us. At this point, we'll sign off. But we hope to catch you next time. And have a great rest of the day.